Well, thank you so much for uh, the music. That was wonderful. Amen. I mean, that was uh, really, really good. I uh, I don't know why I listen to Christian music all the time, but I'd miss that father's house, and I like that. So I'll download that and I'll have it. Hey, what a joy it is to be with you. Uh, I just mentioned, just FYI. Uh, Woodstock was 150 years old when I got there, so I'm not the founding pastor. But uh, they had never planted a church. And just FYI, and you probably ought to know this, this is the very first church I ever planted and ever led a church to plant. And so we're uh, proud of you youngins, all right? So that would be like one of our uh, daughter churches. And so we are grateful. And then all I can say about what Steve has said about us, the feelings are mutual. Uh, I'm grateful. I feel that if God did use us to make an investment in them, that they've given a great return on it. And so I uh, love the energy of this church. Now, if I get to preaching and you kind of lay back after singing like that, I'll probably leave ticked off. All right. So anyway, but I uh, thank you. And I really love the engaging um, worship. Glad my wife and my daughter and my granddaughter and grandson-in-law and their best friend and my son-in-law are all here uh, with me too. And then some friends from Woodstock that I love with all my heart. So just grateful. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Psalm 103. If somebody's with you has a Bible, I hope you'll look on with them. Uh, if you haven't done this, I hope you will download the Bible app so that you'll never be unarmed because I want to teach you some things this morning and I really do believe when you're able to view it and I even pray at times make notes uh, it'll really help you I love the Psalms for 10 years with very few exceptions every morning I begin my day by reading a chapter out of the Psalms so that means every 150 days I make my way through the Psalms. I read this morning Psalm 144. I'm winding down and I just, I enjoy reading them. Why? Uh, it was Israel's hymn book. Uh, it talked of God's dealings with Israel. It told the end of the story. It told of their adversity, but how God ultimately worked in their life. There's no chronological order. You may say, what do you mean by that? Psalm 51 actually comes before Psalm 32. Here's something else maybe you'll find interesting. If you'll read the Psalms, some of them are introduced this way. To the chief musician. Uh, oftentimes it'll list a name like Asap. So what is that all about? It means that after they had written the words, uh, music had been placed to the lyrics, they would give it to the minister of music and say, sing this in temple worship. This is interesting. Did you know Psalm 51 is one that was to be sung in temple worship? That talks about David's sin. So I have a curious mind as studying God's word. So here's the question I ask. I wonder if David was in attendance the day they sung about his sin. Now, uh, I've been in church before and heard a song, and it just resonated with my heart. And I just felt like, boy, that's for me. God spoke there. Uh, a lot of times when I go to a church to preach, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what I'm going to preach. I've not landed on anything. And Henry Blackaby, I don't know that I got it well, but here's what he taught. He taught that you ought to just find out what God's up to and join him. So I've gone into church before, and I keep hearing a word in a song, keep hearing a word from the pastor, and I begin to think, I believe God's leading in this direction. And I may not always get it right, but I try to. I told my wife a moment ago, y'all know when to shout. For instance, a moment ago when he said chains are falling, y'all went crazy. You know why? Because you were thinking about some particular chain. Can I get a witness? Yeah, it's uh, there. And so we're thinking about what God has done in our life. Let me give you another, for instance, I love to uh, attempt to help people to love their Bible more. Uh, Psalms chapter 3, listen to this. It's a morning devotion. What do you mean by that, Pastor Johnny? Well, listen to it. In verse number two of Psalms three, and there's been Psalms written, there's, there's choir arrangements that have been written on Psalm chapter three. Here's what he says. They say of me, there is no help in God. 
Man, that's a big statement. Even God can't help this person. All right, then you turn around and he says this. He, and by the way, you can't say this if you hadn't put scripture to memory. Uh, Thy word have I hidden my heart, treasured my heart, that I may not sin against God. He said, but Lord, you are my shield and my protector. You are the one who lifts my head. Shame oftentimes will have your head down. Jesus <laughs> cleanses us of our shame and lifts our head. And then it says this, and I laid down and slept. The very next verse says this. Though I be surrounded by 10,000, I shall not be afraid. Question I ask is this. What under heaven happened between laying down and getting up? Have you ever gone to bed feeling overwhelmed? God, not sure I'm going to work this out. And you just breathe a prayer and surrender your life to God and get up the next morning and the Spirit of God and the Word of God has taken care of your issue that night. That's one of the great principles of this text. So what we want to do is dive in on Psalm chapter uh, 103, but I, I want you to understand what's going on. So listen to the first two verses. Uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. And here's what he's saying. I need to bless the Lord with every fiber of my being. Then the next verse says this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, here it is, and forget not his benefits. Well, question, what benefits? Sometimes someone says to me, uh, you make a lot of being saved. You're always talking about how it's important to make sure your sin's forgiven or you're a Christ follower, disciple of Jesus. What's the big deal? So stay with me. I'm going to show you in these next few minutes the big deal. It's called the benefits. There's some benefits to having your sins forgiven. There's a benefit uh, of knowing Christ and it leads you to worship him. What do we know about this psalm? We know that it's a self-transcending psalm. What does that mean, Pastor Johnny? It means it's, it's as though the, the author, David in this case, rises above himself and has a talk with his own soul. Now, I want to ask a question. You ever talk to yourself? Well, bless you, they, more, they were one-third the attendance and more people at the early service talked to themselves, but y'all are doing better. I talk to myself all the time. I get up and study the Word of God, spend time with the Lord in prayer, and go for a long walk most mornings. And when I'm out there, I, I talk something like this. Lord, I just got to be honest. I don't know what I was thinking yesterday. In the name of Jesus, I don't know why I said that. I know what it's done in the past when I said that to Janet, so I don't know why, but I ask you to forgive me. Help her to be willing to forgive me. All right, so you just have a talk with yourself. Now, what is he talking to himself about? I'm telling you in Jesus' name, this is a word from God. What is he talking to himself about? The theme is he's grown sluggish in worship. What happened to cause him? We don't know. And I'm glad we don't know because we can speculate. Let me tell you something. I don't know about you, but I didn't see this pandemic coming. Uh, by the way, I sure didn't order it. And when it came, I was like you. I thought in two weeks it would be history. Now we're over seven months. And like it or not, stay with me, it has done a number on the church. It really has. It's done a number on the church. And, and there's, there's no telling us how many people watching by line, writing online. And I'm glad you are. But a lot of, a lot of you are fearful of even going back to church. Now, I'm just going to make a statement, not here to grind an ax, but I want to say this. If I did not believe that the church was essential, I would quit attending. I'd, I'd walk away from God's faith. If I did not believe that as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I was not essential, I want you to know I'd surrender my ordination. I thank God for every nurse. I thank God for every doctor. I thank God for every police officer on the front line. But I know of nobody that dispenses hope, nobody that can talk to you about getting ready for the next life than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for what it's worth on the authority of Almighty God, the church is essential. I feel better. I wanted to get that out there somewhere. And so he really begins with adoration. 
And he says, I want to bless the Lord, which the word bless is the exact same word in the Hebrew, is the word praise. I want to praise the Lord. I want to praise him with all of my soul. Like y'all did in worship a moment ago uh, when we're singing. I mean, y'all were into it. Hands were raised. People were clapping. Amen. Some were whooping and uh, whatever that is. And it, it was just good. And so we praise it. But listen what he did. The psalmist Right after says, I want to praise him for his benefits, he lays down his sacred pen. And he raises his hand toward God. And he counts off on each finger. And he lists five things that ought to cause his sluggish soul to once again be fully embraced in Godlike worship. So with that in mind, let's just dive in and see what they are. The first on his hand is what I call foundation because what I'm going to read in verse number three is foundational to have fellowship with God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. Uh, You become a child of God by repentance, faith in Christ, receiving God's forgiveness, being indwelt by the Spirit of God, and given the glorious gift of of eternal life. And until then, I'm his creation. But I become a child by turning to Christ and receiving him as my Lord and Savior. So look what he says in verse number three. Now, don't forget, as we walk through the sermon, his soul is sluggish. He's grown weary. Stay with me. The circumstances are so overwhelming that it's robbing him of his real relationship with God. Uh, I like to read every morning. I read a great deal. But I read recently, and the greatest pollsters out there, the world leading pollsters, said 51% of the people that used to come to church before the pandemic, and this is just church, there's 50,000 churches across America, 51% have said, We're not going back. Um, well, you may say, How do you feel about that? I didn't plan to talk about this, but let's talk about it for a minute. Um, The Bible says before King Jesus returns, there will be a great falling away. He did not tell me what would uh, um, be the impetus for that to happen. But uh, if there's a great falling away. Matter of fact, here's what I'd say to somebody that plans not to come back. If you can stay away, you ought to stay away. Matter of fact, I'd say this. There's preachers quitting. They're so depressed during this time. Here's what I'd say to a preacher. If you can quit, you ought to quit. But I've just found that I've kind of weird like Jeremiah The times I've thought about quitting, I got a fire shut up in my bones, and I couldn't quit if I wanted to. And I'm going to tell you, if God lives in your heart, and he said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you, if you can walk up. Well, anyway, just. So foundation, the Bible says, who forgives, here it is, here it is, who forgives all your iniquity. The The word forgives is used in Scripture only of God's forgiveness of sinners. You say, is that significant? Yeah. Did you know you can't get saved until you acknowledge you're a sinner? I've witnessed before and I'd say, well, you know, you need to realize, first of all, all have sinned come short of the glory of God. Do you realize you're a sinner? Had a person say to me one time, well, I'm not that bad. Uh, Well, you may not feel you're that bad, but you're a sinner and you're in need of a savior. And so that's why Steve preaches so hard to help people see they're lost because people aren't willing to get found and they realize they're lost. People don't realize they need forgiveness until they realize that they're a sinner. Some of you may know this, but I pastored the governor of the state of Georgia for eight years, Sonny Perdue. Sonny and Mary have been great friends to us and we're grateful for them. Serves on the cabinet with the president of the United States today. Um, near the end of his tenure, we had a lady in our church, and um, she had a really uh, rough past. And how many of you are grateful that you can get past your past? And uh, she used to run. Now, you older ones like me will have to help the younger ones understand this. But listen to this. She uh, used to run a go-go club. Uh, that's where women would not much clothes, stood in the windows and danced. The music was loud. And they were kind of known as houses of prostitution. Uh, she ran that. She was extremely rough. She fought a lot. She's like 6'4", big lady. She hurt a lot of men and women. Uh, she had had several abortions. And my wife reminded me a moment ago, 
she had been arrested for armed robbery, which made her a felon. So I'd never had this happen before in my life. She came to me and said, would you help me? I said, how can I help you? She was a member at Woodstock. And by the way, she'd been out living for Jesus for 30 years. So she had a testimony to stand the test of time. She said, do you think you could represent me to Governor Sonny Perdue and get me a pardon? Now, y'all have heard of that. You've heard where people with the governor before he goes out or the president can offer pardons. And so the, the governor said, Johnny, let's try but we're so late into my term, I'm not sure I can pull it off before my last day in office. Well, he was not able to pull it off. It was too late. But I learned something. Guess what the number one principle of receiving a pardon is? You cannot be pardoned by the state of Georgia unless you acknowledge your guilt. And I just need to tell you, until you acknowledge your guilt before God, you cannot be forgiven. You can't receive a pardon. Calvary cannot make a difference in your life until I admit I'm guilty. And then when you acknowledge you're guilty, you can be forgiven. The Bible says he forgives us of our iniquity. Why do you use that word? There's three words the psalmist uses. He uses sin transgression, iniquity. Sin means I've missed the mark. Transgression means I've overstepped God's law. Iniquity speaks of who I am. It means that I have this ingrained perversity. It means I'm twisted in my mind and in my heart. And by the way, only God can straighten that out. That's why when somebody brings a person like me, I was raised by a single mom, Dad checked out when I was seven. I quit school at 16, managed a pool hall, hustled pool, no purpose, no direction in life. So when somebody took me to church, I found my, are you listening? My twisted mind and heart sort of uh, going back and forth with what I heard. I, I didn't understand it. And it's not until God takes the gospel of God, the spirit of God, and begins to speak into your heart that the lights come on, God raises the blinds, and you're able to see the glorious gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. And God changes your life. Let me go a step further. Forgiveness is a powerful word. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, it has the idea to take away and put somewhere else. What do you mean, forgiveness, to take away and to put somewhere else? Well, I'm not going to preach this far into this text, but listen to verse number 10. God has not dealt with us according to our sins. Well, wait a minute. If God's not dealt with us according to our sins, question, who did God deal with for my sins? That's the gospel. He dealt with Jesus. It means the punishment, and I'll show it to you in this verse, that I deserve, God gave it to his son. Listen to the latter part of verse 10. Nor has God punished us according to our iniquity. He punished Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What does that mean? It means that I could never stand before God in my own merit, but that Jesus Christ is an acting attorney, a lawyer that stands up and speaks on my behalf. I will never have to answer for myself. Jesus paid it all, all to him. Uh, but the next verse says this. Who is the big word? propitiation for my sins, but not for my sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Pastor Johnny, what does propitiation mean? All right, listen to this. It's intriguing. It's the exact same Hebrew word for the word mercy seat. It is where we derive our word atonement, where Christ paid for our sin debt. So what does it mean he's our propitiation? It means that when Jesus was, was dying for us, he did not abort the wrath of God so we could be saved. He absorbed the wrath of God so we could be saved. So I want you to know that when Jesus was on the cross, uh, he took my sin. He bore everything I've done. So if it was drunkenness, Jesus let the sin of drunkenness nail him to the cross. And here's what the Bible says in Colossians 2.14. He has taken my sin and he's nailed it to the cross, taking it out of the way. And so I'm so, now, now what's going on in this text? He's kind of sluggish in worship. He's, he's kind of sluggish. Pandemic's done a number on him. 
but he gets to thinking about what God's done for him. I don't think he's sitting anymore. I believe he's standing up. And then I think he's starting to do a little bit of the jig. I mean, he's thinking about what God has done for him, and it raises him up. So I'm telling you, let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone to church when you didn't feel like it? Have you ever gone to church and didn't feel like when you left, you were bold enough to tell the preacher, I decided to come to last moment. I really weren't into it today. I've had a lot of struggles, and I was thinking more inward. But I came, and God knew exactly what I needed. God met me right where I am. And by the way, let me tell you why you ought to come to church when you don't feel like it. Christianity is not a fair weather religion. It's not if the sun's shining, God is there. I want to tell you, let the storms come. He's a storm transformer. Jesus can change it all when we look to him. And so he paid the price. I, um, I love to quote people I knew that I preached with. I studied their commentaries. And then, when, you know what? They died before I did. Uh, Warren Weirdsby died this year. There, I'm just going to make a statement. It's not a preacher in the Southern Baptist Convention. There's 47,000 churches. Every preacher in every one of those churches, I'll guarantee you, has some, if not all, of Warren Weirdsby. You got any Warren Weirdsby books, son? All right, Warren Weirdsby's books. Somebody said to me one time, said, well, why did you fall in love with his books? Well, when I got saved, I was 20 years old. When I was 23, Janet and I started serving our first church. I'd only been saved three years. Didn't have a Bible until the night I got saved. So three years in, I'm the pastor. God pushed me in the deep end. I got me some Warren Wearsby called B series. They're, they just give good little sermons. So I was now needing to preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. How'd you come up with all those sermons? Warren Wearsby. Somebody said to me, well, Johnny Hunt, that's plagiarism. No, I totally disagree. It weren't plagiarism, brother. It was survival. If you were going to survive and you had to preach every week, you better find somebody to help you. And just for the record's sake, next time you say a preacher preach somebody else's sermon, it's plagiarism. Did you write every song you sang this morning? I just thought I'd throw it out there this morning for what it's worth. I've always wanted to say that. No, we sing other people. That's not plagiarism. You didn't write that song. And you're singing it. And I've preached to many. If I'd start to throw it in for Warren Wiersbe. John Phillips was another one. Boy, what a mind. He was mentored by the person that taught me preaching. His name was Stephen Alford. He was known the Prince of Preachers, uh, raised on, in Africa on the mission field. Uh, John Phillips said, you know, John, we've been forgiven. But even though we've been forgiven, how many of you know that the devil is the accuser of the brethren? Yeah. He accuses us. The Bible says he accuses us before the Father night and day. Now, here's what Johnny Hunt believes. John 8, 44, Jesus said that every lie there is came from the devil. He is the originator of every lie. If you told a lie and thought it was your lie, it weren't your lie, it was his lie. He just got hold of you. But Johnny believes that there's a time he tells the truth. He tells the truth when he brings an accusation against a child of God. But why does he tell the truth? He don't have to lie. We give him all the stuff he needs. That, that was a good statement. If you missed that, you missed a good <laughs> statement. Well, John Phillips was asked, said, so, so Satan accuses me before the Father, and I'm guilty of what he said. How does the Father respond? He says he just raises his nail-scarred hands, and it speaks it all. I've been forgiven. There's another word, not just foundation, restoration. Look at verse number three. It says, who heals all your diseases. What do you mean, Pastor Johnny? Um, much of our physical and emotional illness is psychogenic due to moral failure. And the only relief is God's forgiveness, which results in healing. Well, what do you mean? All right, Luke chapter six, verse 17, favorite place, one of my favorite places to go when I'm in Israel is Capernaum. Why? Capernaum is where Jesus held his headquarters. There's so much evidence of his presence there. Uh, the Bible says that he went about Capernaum and he healed them of their diseases. He said that he even healed those that were tormented with unclean spirits. The Bible says a whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and he healed them all. You know, even though when you get saved, Jesus Christ delivers you from the grip of sin, a lot of us still struggle with the guilt of sin. 
e- even though you've been forgiven, you find yourself mentioning it to him again two or three years later. Why, why do we do that? Because he did, do you believe he forgave you? Yeah, I really do. I just still struggle with the guilt. At Woodstock on Super Bowl Sunday weekend, we're coming up on year number 29 in February, Lord willing, uh, we do a thematic um, men's conference. So this year it's called the Lone Wolf, the Lone Wolf. God never called any of us to be alone. That's why the devil's doing a number on the church. He's got people at home alone. And you know, that's why the word of God says in in Hebrews 10, verse 23 through 25, to forsake not the assembling of yourself together. Jesus knew we needed one another. And he said, we excite, we excite one another to love and good works. And this, y'all excite me. I wouldn't be preaching near as hard if y'all didn't sing so hard. So excites me from what, what I heard. And, and so, uh, I did one called Prison Break. John, maybe you remember, 20-foot chain, chain link fence. Across the top, barbed wire. Guess, guess what else we got? We, we actually rented some of those big prison lights, big old white lights, shining it through the congregation. But I asked them to put a door in the front of the gate, and here's how I illustrate it. When you got saved, God opened the prison door, and you walked out free. He, he set you free from the grip of sin. But look at me. Look at me. You got to watch to see this. But we came out dragging the ball and chain. Even though he set us free of the grip, we're still struggling with the guilt of our past. And, and yet the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that God has taken the blood of Jesus to cleanse our conscience. Because so, 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 the Bible says our conscience condemns us but God, this is good, but God is greater than our conscience. And so, see, he heals you the diseases of guilt and fear and doubt and depression and anger and lust and hate and jealousy and greed. The list goes on and on. But now let me move to a third, my final, or not, no, not my final, my favorite. I got confused. Favorite. Redemption. Look what he says in verse 4. Who redeems your life from destruction. Let me translate that. Being rescued. It refers to the consequences of God's healing. Now, don't miss this. It's one of the most important statements of my sermon. He redeems your life from going to waste. You ever heard somebody say this? I'll be honest with you. I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't got saved when I got saved. So let's just play a little mind game. You can't know exactly, but let me just ask you this. Where, where, would, where would you be now? if it were not for Jesus. Now, I'll tell you where I believe I'd been. I, I was arrested for drunk driving. I was arrested for stealing. And I was arrested for fighting. Somebody says, you're not that big. No, but I'm wound tight, all right? But the bottom line is, and so three times before I was 20 years old, I'd been to jail. All right, um, my wife will tell you, two or three nights a week, Red Flock Saloon, pool room gambling, Charles Spurgeon said when he got saved, he lost 80% of his vocabulary. That's how I was, out of filthy mouth. And, and boy, I was just going down the wrong road. But I got rescued. He, he, he saved me from my life going to waste. So I wrote it this way. God, God didn't just save me from my sin. God saved me from myself. See, some of you come and say, hey, how about praying for my boy? Uh, he's on the wrong path. Here's what you're saying. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end is destruction. Here's what you're saying. The road that he's on, he's going to self-destruct. But then, aren't you glad God steps in and intervenes and rescues you? The first sermon, isn't this weird? Did you know I've got a copy of every sermon I've ever preached in my life? I was not even a pastor yet. They invited me to preach on Baptist Men's Day. And I still have memorized only the title and what the sermon was about. The title of my first sermon I ever wrote was this. The Lord wants to do for you what he did for the Israelites. That was my sermon title. It was from Deuteronomy chapter 6. What was the theme? God brought you out that God may bring you in. See, some of you have have experienced Calvary. He's brought you out, but you've not experienced a resurrection. (laughs) He wants to bring you in. 
It's not just what God, oh, this is good. It's not just what God saved me from. It's what God saved me to. I mean, God has a future and a purpose for you, and it's not to harm you. And so I've got to press in and find that. So he's, he brought me out. Well, I'll give you two other words, and I'm going to do them in the five minutes that I've got left. Here it is. The word compassion. The Bible says he crowns you with loving tenderness and tender mercy. So let me just tell you what that means. Uh, loving kindness is mercy. It means God crowned me not with what I deserved. If God had given me what I deserved, I, I would be a crispy critter. What does he mean he crowns us? We're a child of the king. We're royal. What else does it mean? He said one day when he returns, and can I just remind you this morning, look at me. He's coming back. He's coming back, and it may be a lot sooner than we think. But he's coming back. And when he comes back, he says we're going to reign and rule with him. But, but that's, there's more to it than that. The Beatitudes, you know what the Beatitudes is thematic. You know what the theme of the Beatitudes is? Reigning in life with Christ. See, he says this, now that you've been saved and forgiven and I've saved your life from going to waste, listen to this promise. He said, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Well, if sin doesn't have dominion, who has dominion? King Jesus. Well, if King Jesus has dominion, I can reign in life with him. Because he lives his life through me. I've got a king living inside of me. Yeah. He's done so much for me. But then this last point, and by the way, I want you to learn from this last point, but it's for Steve Flockhart. So Vicki, I want you to hear, ne I, don't, I never do this. I've been preaching 43 years. I've never directed a thought and said, preacher, this morning when I was going through the text, God put you on my heart. And so I want to speak a word over Steve from this passage. So listen to verse five. And, and by the way, this verse, some of you are taking notes, it has a twist to it. And without being able to translate what it means, it's, it's hard to understand. So listen to it. And I'm done. I'm not done. I'm just going to quit. <laughs> Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that, the purposeful clause, your youth is renewed like an eagle. Pastor Johnny, what can you tell us about this text? David is an old man. The older you get, the more you reflect. He's reflecting on his life. And as he's grown older, he's not as strong as he used to be, but God gave him a promise. Now, how do you translate the word mouth? Are you with me? Mouth. It translates old age or duration of years. How, how did this happen? I started preaching when I was 23. I'm 68. How did I get here? Good night. My wife and I are celebrating 50 years of marriage, November the 21st. How could we have been married 50 years? I mean, look at her. She's only like 40. I mean, this is ridiculous how God has worked this out. So translate it. Since mouth translates old age or duration of year, here's what he's saying. This is good. No matter how old we become, God can satisfy the needs of our lives and the spiritual desires of our heart. Go, go a step further. One theologian said, this is a beautiful picture of happy old people. Yeah. Why is that so important? Have you ever met some old people that weren't happy? I, I do the largest senior adult conference in the United States. So look at me. I'll go outside after I preach in order to sign Steve Flockhart's devotion. And while I'm out there signing them, they'll say to me, uh, senior adult, man or woman, Pray for me, Brother Hunt. Uh, my grandchildren hadn't been to see me in three years. And then I, I keep signing and listening. And then they get real negative. I mean, just the conversation goes downhill. So I, I entertain myself with thoughts, but I don't tell anybody what I'm thoughting, or I'd be in trouble. So while I'm writing, here's what I think. If I was your grandson, <laughs> I wouldn't come see you either. You are one negative dude. I mean, it's just, it's a, so, and I, I'll just be honest. I don't want to be like that. I really don't. I don't, I don't want to grow. I'd rather God take me to heaven now than me grow old and dumpy. So this morning, my daughter called and said, I'm coming to hear you preach, Daddy. I thought, yes. And then my granddaughter, aren't you preaching a lot? I want to come hear you preach. So my granddaughter said, and then my granddaughter, my 16-year-old granddaughter called me this week and said, Papa, I've been missing you. 
I need some good time with you. When can I have time with you? And she was out of school on Wednesday, and I weren't traveling that day. So I said, well, we'll spend the day together. And she kind of threw this caveat in. You mean like go shopping? And that, that really does help. Like <laughs> I used to tell my wife, I used to say, if you notice the children and grandchildren love to go out to eat with us. And she just smiled. I said, what are you smiling at? She said, they love for you to pay. But anyway, it's... Uh, <laughs> Part of it, I'm, I'm willing to bear that cross, all right? But, but I want to be a happy old person. But now, here's the close of the sermon. What's going on in this text? What is the theme? Eagles, that's the theme. But what is it teaching us about eagles? Eagles molt. Those of you in any phone, you want to search it, don't search it now, but just t- type in the word M-O-L-T or molting, M-O-L-T-I-N-G. So what are they doing? When eagles are young, they build their nest on the highest mountain peaks. There was a bad storm in Atlanta last Saturday night. Not last night, but a Saturday a week ago. There were tornado warnings. Let me tell you what eagles do. Fly into the storm, fix their wings where the winds take them above the storm, and they soar above the storms. But when they get old, they don't. Where do you find an eagle that is molting? You find them in the valley. Anything else? Normally near water. What are they doing? They're losing their wings. Getting older. David's feeling like he's losing some of his wings. And then the Lord says, I'm going to satisfy you in your old age with some good things so that your, your youth is going to be renewed. I mean, I've got as much energy as I've ever had. I feel I can do anything I've ever done. It just takes three times as long to recover. <laughs> But I can do it. I walk three to five miles practically every morning of my life. Very few exceptions. I mean, I preach. Honest, the other day, I've been preaching six and seven times every weekend. I mean, just, I mean, God has just given me strength. So what is he saying? He says, I'm going to give you a new lease on life. So as I get older, it don't mean that I slow down. I know more about the Bible now than I've ever known in my life. I really do believe I'm a better preacher than I was when I was 30 or 40 years old. I've learned so much more. I'm somewhat seasoned. Miss Janet's taught me so much. And and so the bottom line, I want to press in. And so, Steve, I believe the word for your life is this. Um, You're still going to soar, my man. You got some years. And this is a great church, man. I preach a lot across the country. A lot. I was just at First Baptist Church Dallas, for heaven's sake. But I mean, you're hard pressed to find a congregation that's so engaged in the Word, so in love with worship. And what I mean, and my grandson's here. I didn't know my grandson came in too. Got the whole crime. If we keep talking, I'll, I'll just have the whole hunt tribe <laughs> to slip in. And, and so, so it's a word for Steve and for Vicky that God's done a great work. Now, some of you have taken as your favorite verse. Psalm 40, 31. So now listen to it in the context of molting. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. So by now, what's happening with the psalmist? Worship is no longer sluggish. Brother, he's engaged. He's looking for some sinner to tell the benefits that can only come through a personal relationship with Almighty God. And that ought, that ought to happen. If you're going out to eat today, you ought to be hard-pressed to not be able to speak a good word for Jesus to whoever waits on you. It'd be hard to catch your neighbor in the yard and not tell them about great worship at your church and invite them to come. God is doing something. So I close with this question. Have you ever experienced God's benefits? Why am I saying this? Pastor Johnny, would you tell us what you think in your years of studying of the worst consequence of hell? I sure will. A conscious remembrance. Jesus Christ gave the story in Luke 16 of a person going to hell. Here's what he said. Through Abraham, a man's in hell. And he's, he's calling out for help. And he says this, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime. I don't think anything could be worse in hell than to be able to remember the opportunities. Not now. Later. Not yet. 
Not for me. And I believe all, all through eternity. I go through. Father, in the name of Jesus, have your will and way in each of our lives. God, I pray that you would save the lost in this service. I pray that those that have, are walking at a guilty distance, they've grown cold in their heart. I pray in Jesus' name that you would bring them out of their sluggishness to once again be fully engaged in authentic worship. Speak for Christ's sake. It's about eyes closed in the quietness of this moment and this very, very holy moment. You hear today, you say, I am a Christian. I know that Jesus lives inside of me. I know heaven's my home when I die. But I've gotten kind of sluggish. I've kind of forgotten some things that we heard this morning. And today, maybe you need to reconnect your heart back to God. I would encourage you to do that today. Many of you here today, you say, you know, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't know 100% sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that my sins have truly ever been forgiven. I don't know that Jesus actually lives inside of me. Sir, ma'am, young person, if that's you, if you don't know 100% sure right now that Christ lives in you, that heaven's your home, I'm getting ready to pray a prayer right now, and I'm going to pray it out loud. And online and in this building, I'm going to encourage you to pray it with me. A lady at 9 o'clock raised her hand so high and so excited about she had received Christ. She met me outside at the tent and said, hey, I prayed that prayer, and, and we got to talk. And so I want to encourage you. If you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God is crazy, madly, head over heels in love with you. So much so that he sent his son to die for you. He suffered, he bled, he died, he rose from the dead. And now he wants to step out of heaven and step into your life and forgive you and change you. But that decision is yours. God is speaking, you know it. Your heart is being pulled and tugged right now. And today's your day. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Open your heart. So as I pray this prayer out loud, you can pray it in your heart, and but you got to mean it. This is you giving your life to Jesus. It's a really big deal. So pray this prayer with me. Just say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, oh God, I do know that I've sinned against you, and I am so very sorry. Today, I'm willing to turn away from my sin. And yes, God, I believe that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. And the best way I know how right now, I'm surrendering, I'm giving up. I'm asking you to come into my life, to save me, to forgive me, to change me. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got saved forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to read the Bible, to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in, or even on this online campus we've got going on here, or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just pray that prayer, text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.